Hi, I'm Brett Peterson, the Business Rogue. Uh, today we're here with Adriel Wiggins, who's a business consultant in the publishing world. So Adriel, can you tell us a little bit about, about who you are, what you do, your company? Well, Adriel Wiggins Author Services and Consulting is the culmination of many years of me trying to do a lot of different things nice. and and finally finding my niche mm -hmm. and so I wanted to be an editor I wanted to be an author I wanted to be a radio talk show host sure. I wanted to be about a billion other things um, and finally I got to the sweet spot where mm -hmm. I can do all the things I wanted to do even though they're not necessarily exactly what I thought they would be nice but I get to be in the publishing world, which for me was one of the biggest goals. Fantastic, way so. to go. So what pulled you into publishing? Like what was your initial draw? Were you a writer first or? I was a writer first. Okay, um, nice. I did all the contests mm -hmm. as elementary and, and high school that they're like, sure. write this and we might put it in a contest if it's good enough. Well, sure. I did all of them. Nice. Um, and then I started researching um, children's magazines. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was, in college, I had probably about a dozen short stories or um, children's poetry in children's magazine, and that was my primary focus for quite a long time nice. until I had kids and stopped writing. <laughs> so can we talk, one of the things I talk about with the viewers on my channel, businesses take three, five longer, three, five years or longer to yes. get started. So can you tell us, uh, without being, if that's not too personal, can you tell us the timeline on that, like the years? Um, for at the beginning when I was just writing it was probably a good five years sure. that all I did was children's magazines and sure. that's all I submitted to mm -hmm. um, I even did a um, special college I guess it would be an associate's degree sure. um, for specifically for children's writing Wow. Um, and then discovered that really wasn't it so then I went and did a whole bunch of other careers sure. and and learned a lot of things um, and then as an adult, and now I have kids that are much older, mm -hmm. I said, I really want to get back into the publishing world. But in the meantime, the publishing world had completely changed. Sure. Can you so, tell me a little bit about how that happened or what happened? Well, when I was publishing in the beginning, it was in the 90s and early 2000s. Sure. There was only traditional publishing. Right. Um, and then in... E-books were a weird thing you pirated on the internet. They weren't really there. Right. If you could find them. They were right. Things on the internet. Right. right. Exactly. If if they were there, they they typically were a PDF scan of a heart of an actual paper. Right. That was it. Right. Um, and for some authors that's all they could do. So <laughs> sure. you know, but that was better than nothing. But Absolutely. it was there were no tools at all for mm -hmm. authors. So when I came back to the publishing world, all of a sudden not only not only were self-publishers no longer the bane of everybody's existence, the, sure. the people who just couldn't hack it, the awful worst writers in the world, because mm -hmm. that was the perception for a very long time. Right. But now, because we had the internet and we had all kinds of smart people contributing to it, suddenly we had tools that we could use. So it became much more attainable for people, which right. To be fair, it means there was a flood of really terrible writers for sure. a while and really terrible books. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it was very obvious to look at a book on a store shelf, whether that was Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and know which one was indie and which one wasn't, simply because the quality wasn't there that a publishing house had. I remember looking at books in that era, because I also ran a small publishing house in that yeah. era. I've talked about it on the channel a little bit, but I remember being able to pick up a book and say, the color of the page is always wrong. Exactly. It had like bright white paper, it looked like it was printer paper, and it hurts your eyes to read. Exactly. And so I, you start looking at a traditionally published book, and oh, it's a nice cream or yes. cream or yeah, yes. something, so I, my eyes don't bleed. Yeah. And, and that, a lot of that, now that we have more tools and now that we have more avenues of publishing yeah. besides just Amazon or the big five, mm -hmm. which I guess they're the big four now. Sure, this, soon to be the this, big one. This yeah. dates us, <laughs> we're currently the big four. Um, I'll put a, a date on the video, it'll be good, yeah, it'll be fine. Um, but when I came back to publishing, mm -hmm. Th everything had changed. So yeah. I had to start from scratch all over again. Sure. And this time I didn't really approach it as an author. Mm -hmm. This time I said, I want to be an editor. That's what I'd always wanted. I wanted sure. to be a very special kind of editor. Sure. I do not like copy editing, sure. but uh, because of that. Sorry, 
Copy editing is line by line editing. Developmental editing is when you change the story. Sorry. What I do, continuity editing makes sure all the details don't change. Nice. So okay, yeah. I do that within a book, I do that within a series. Um, so that's all, all, that's a very special niche. There, to be honest, aren't a lot of people who want to pay the extra money for that. Sure. Um, so it was hard to start up just editing. Sure. It was, it was hard to build the reputation at the beginning. It was hard to get enough clients at the beginning. Sure. So I added the virtual assistant side of the business because nice. it was nice, steady work. Sure, absolutely. But it meant I had to go back to school. Gotcha. Um, so I learned about the publishing industry, the current publishing industry with indies and, and self-publishing and all of that mm -hmm. from the virtual assistant side. Ah. So it was purely business. Gotcha. Um, and because of that, I was able to put together and apply a lot of the things that I had learned in all the careers I'd had up until that point. Sure. And then now apply them to just indie publishing. And in the meantime, I also worked with a lot of small presses. Sure. And so because of that, I, I was blending all the things I had learned from being a, a traditional publisher 20 years ago sure. with all the things I was learning as an indie publisher. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, I, was, I was able to find a really sweet spot that I really liked that yeah. when an author is ready to really make a business of it, mm -hmm. not this uh, is something I kind of want to do and I do it on the weekend sometimes. Yeah. And I want, if I sell a few books, I'm great, right? Sure. When you're really ready to make it a business and take it to the next level, I'm here to say, okay, this is how we do it. Nice. This, this is a plan. This will work for you and your audience and what you want. Nice. And um, that, like I said, it's a culmination of years and years and lots of different industries, learning lots of different pieces, and now I get to put them together. And that's my favorite part. Nice. Well, one of the things we talk on the channel sometimes is about that conjunction, that, that special niche you find that's mm -hmm. unique to you, right? Yes. That, that you can serve better than anybody else can. And so yes. it sounds like you found that in this publishing world, which is awesome. That's, right. Yeah. And I want to call out too, as a, as a consultant in the business you build, you've got several different kinds of products. I do. So, so we talk about four different kinds of products, like physical things, yes. services, information, and experiences. Yes. And it sounds like you're selling services, information, and experiences. Yes. And so that gives you a nice... Do you want to talk about that? Yes. Yeah, please. So um, services that I provide are things like the continuity editing mm -hmm. and audiobook proofing. Those are my two major, this is what I provide. Sure. Nice. Um, I do provide the VA still, but like mm -hmm. I said, now that, every, now that I've built up the business and right. I no longer need to rely on it for steady income, right. I have a very much smaller VA clientele. Sure. Um, and I'm really happy with them. Sure. <laughs> so uh, that is one of the things we could talk about is uh, finding who you're compatible to do business with. Sure, so that's a, whole, that's a whole other thing. So I'll go back to that in okay, a second. Yeah. Remind me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that, that is, th those are the primary things, the editing and the audiobook proofing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, for the information, I have my website and my newsletter mm -hmm. and my social media. All of that is general free information for anybody who wants to come look at it. Right. Um, and that is aimed toward new authors and also really experienced authors. Mm -hmm. So depending upon which format it is or where you jump into what I'm writing every day, mm -hmm. um, you're going you're gonna to get some really basic stuff, but you're also going to get some really advanced stuff when you're ready for that. It's there. That's a really good idea. And one, one thing we've talked about, we've talked a little bit on the channel is like, when you're selling information, it has to be limited information. It does. And, and so using your information as a marketing tool is really wise, I think, because it's, yeah. not, it's not that nobody's paying for it per se, but it still draws people right. to your paid services. Exactly. They can f uh, that information can be found other places or it could be copied if somebody did pay for it, they could copy it and sell right. it on their own site, right? Right. And so I think that was a really wise move to make that thing that's very non-scarce and very hard to charge for yes. into a marketing tool rather than a, a product you're making money on. Right. I thought about making them um, into products that I sell. Sure. Um, because passive income, yeah. which a course or book done correctly is. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Is very appealing. Absolutely. Um, from a business standpoint. The more passive income I can set up, the better. Sure. Um, leveraging about, my time, yeah. Yeah, and we talk about courses, which is a little different. That's not quite yeah. so copyable, right? Yes. So that's, that's a lot more easier to make a business around. Exactly. Because they're, they're looking at you, not 
exactly. the words, right? Yeah. Right. And, but even then, even when you have courses and books, you still have to draw them in somehow, or they're never going to sign up for your $600 course right. on how to organize your life right. as an author. Right. Right. That's, I mean, that's what I do. Yeah. I help you organize your life as an author. Mm -hmm. So, but they don't want to pay $600 for that if they have not seen a year's worth of me saying, here's a tip for today. Here's today's tip. Here's today's tip. Oh, let's put some of those together into the newsletter, you know? So um, you have, as a good marketer, you have to give away some, mm -hmm. not everything. Sure. And not even, I mean, this is, this is a huge debate right now in the business to business community mm -hmm. is no, sell your very lowest thing. You just sell it really cheap, but now they're a paying customer. And so now you sell them the next thing and the next thing and the next thing I'm like, but you're never going to find them in the first place right. if you don't give the free thing away first. Yeah. I'm not going to pay for something I haven't tasted. Exactly. Yeah. So yes, there's different tiers and you start out with free and then you do the $10 product and then the $5 and the, you know, for the $50 product and then the hundred one, and then you can sell the $600 course. So your music to our, my ears, one of the things we do is YouTube money where we go to yes. the YouTubers and say, here's the ways they could, they could start a business around what they've done so far. Right. And we always talk about that. How can we get, we break up our market into the tiers, into different tiers of, yeah. based on purchasing power. That's not the best market segmentation, but no. it's a quick and dirty one we can use. As it example. is. Yeah. And it's especially with authors. That's one that they can see easily because exactly. you know, you know how much an ebook is supposed to cost versus right. a paperback versus a hardback. Right. And so turning that concept into a, okay, but this product, now this one, now this one, now this one, mm -hmm. They can do that. It's a lot easier to see and understand as an author mm -hmm. than I have to give something away. I have to sell it cheap. I have to sell this, cheap, you know, sure. a little bit more expensive. So, so speaking of giving things away, how do you feel and how do you work with authors who do like Kindle Unlimited or Vela or things that are free-ish? Um, right. How do you how do you grapple with those? Um, to me, that's one other form of business. Okay, so. Sure. Every author is different. Absolutely. Uh, they have different personalities. They have different backgrounds. They have different um, more internal moral systems. They have different everything, yeah. right? So the, the biggest challenge, what I have fun doing, is customizing a business plan for you that fits you. Nice. Yeah. So it's going to fit your idea of how you should sell books. Gotcha, okay. And it's gonna fit your idea of who you should sell books to. And it's going to fit your idea of, or it's going to fit how you actually function, whether or not you want to recognize that you function that way. Sure. Like if you're completely and totally disorganized, mm -hmm. I have a method for you that even you can do. Sure. If you are very OCD and really love organization, I have a method for you too. Nice. So that's, for me, the greatest fun comes in customizing a plan for each author based on them. Sure. Um, so Kindle Unlimited or Vela or any of the others mm -hmm. that are free-ish, right. that's just one more marketing strategy. That, mm -hmm. is, that is one more piece of a business plan. Sure. And it's, to be perfectly honest, no different than going wide or even, you know, only selling through Kickstarter or sure. only selling through your website. Sure. Those are all different tools and we're going to find one that fits you, that fits your readership, that mm -hmm. that is going to work with you and your business the best. Makes so, sense. Yeah. Oh, cool. So let me ask on, on that business plan. One of the things we talk about on the channel is a little bit scaling. Mm -hmm. So that personalized business plan is awesome because your, your market segment is one, right? So right. you can really nail the need of that particular customer. Right. But scaling is that is very difficult, right? So how do, yes. you, how do you see your business scaling? So uh, this is actually the primary thing I worked in 2021 gotcha. was was I was saying I'm I'm working a lot of hours yeah absolutely and I really love my job absolutely but um, my kids are at those really exciting ages of middle school and high school mm -hmm. where I actually want to be with them sure. and do stuff with them a lot yeah absolutely um, but <laughs> the best way to do that is to not work 24 seven. Sure. Um, you know, my husband and I have gone through periods, especially when we were working really hard to get out of debt, that mm -hmm. both of us worked over hundred hours a week. We're not there anymore. Right. We're out of debt. 
nice. all we have left is our mortgage Congratulations. and we're working on it and yeah. it's great so yeah. but now we really want to focus and spend more time on the kids and doing stuff as a family and um i know my parents have health issues mm -hmm. we live down the block so we're the ones that go right take care of things and because of that you know i i wanted to say all right how can i still do this business mm -hmm. that's not me working 24 hours a day um, and so a lot of that the last year has been shifting to a lot of passive income mm -hmm. and also um, really niching down what exactly I wanted to provide. Sure. And, and this is why I'd say over the course of the six years that I've had the VA part of the business open, mm -hmm. I've had probably 30, 40 clients. Okay. Um, I'm down to three. Wow, okay, gotcha. So what I do now mm -hmm. is so specific versus in the beginning, I just needed clients and right. I needed money. Yeah. I did everything. Yeah. I took on anybody, I, I did whatever they needed, <laughs> right. and I learned a lot of hard lessons. Sure. So now I have niched down so much that I don't need a ton of clients. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm happier. <laughs> yes. But I work much more reasonable hours and I still have a steady income. Very nice. Um, but it, like I said, it took time mm -hmm. and it also took really focusing solely on setting up a bunch of passive income this past year. The 2021 was let's put as much passive income into play as we can. Awesome. Can you describe some of your passive income streams or is that, if it's no, that's information fine. I don't want to, yeah. Um, um, I'm an affiliate with not everyone, but pretty much. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if it is a service mm -hmm. that authors use, sure, is from the newsletter to the you know selling on Amazon mm -hmm. and everything in between. Sure. I'm an affiliate. Oh, nice. Okay. So some of those I make more money than others. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and. I try not to do competing things. Sure. So like I looked at a lot of different mail systems and I chose ConvertKit. Okay. I use ConvertKit. I think it works really well for all creatives, but especially for authors. Um, but a lot of my clients, you know, in the past have used MailChimp and MailJet and Mail, um, I can't even remember all of them, Sendbox, right? all those, yeah. All of those, mm -hmm. and I have worked in all of those, and I like and dislike things about all of them. Sure. And to be honest, there's things I don't love about ConvertKit as course, well. Of course, yeah. But I chose to affiliate with ConvertKit. Right. Um, so, oh. at the, no, the bookstores aren't quite the same thing. I can affiliate with everybody oh, and they course. don't care. Yeah. Um, but I would be kind of wrong if I talked to different mail systems. So I am, I, I don't, I don't affiliate with everybody in the world. Sure. That Are would you, be really hard. But if it's for authors, then I'm going to look at it and I'm going to really consider it. And I'm going to say, does this fit with everything else that I provide for authors? Sure. And if it does, then I'm going to sign up. Nice. So a full stack almost of, yeah. of author services in, in what you're affiliated with and also what you provide, which is exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of a, I hate this phrase, but soup to nuts, end to end is a better way to say it. Yeah. And then process that you can support you can provide to authors. Exactly. And especially beginning authors. That sounds like a very forgive me for saying it sounds like your target market, at least initially, was probably beginning authors. Is yes. that correct? It was. Okay, yeah. How has that changed? Um I don't I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. Sure. Um the more authors I took on that had experience. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to learn things from them. Yeah. But they couldn't do one thing that I did well. Sure. So that's what I do for them. Mm -hmm. The more I realized um, there can be a gap okay. between people who love to write and mm -hmm. do it as a hobby and people who run it as a business. Gotcha. And it's not always necessary necessarily very evident on the surface mm -hmm. where someone falls into one of those camps. Sure. Um, so I had to get better at learning 
You can be brand new, never having written a book, but you're writing a book now mm -hmm. and be 100% professional yeah. and it's going to be your business. Mm -hmm. Or you can have 10 books under your belt and you're still treating it like a hobby and you don't care whether or not you make money from it. Sure. So finding the sweet spot in there for me was people who really, they're serious, they want to work it as a business. This is, I want to get out of my day job. Right. But I don't really know what I'm doing. Sure. <laughs> so that's really, truly who I'm, my core uh, client is. Sure. Um, that's a great behavioral market segmentation, right? It is. So it, or even, it's kind of psychogra psychographic, right? Yes. How do people see the world? I want people to see the world this way, not that way. Yes. And that's totally appropriate. That means you can focus your efforts on a better paying clientele that is exactly. more suited to your business and your needs. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the uh, hard lessons I learned. The first year that I officially opened the VA side of the business and I literally took on anybody. Right. One of the very first things I learned was I'm not the right VA for everybody. Sure and not everybody is the right client for me. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of what I, when I was seeing the dividing line between people that I worked well with and people I didn't, mm -hmm. almost always it was, what is their mindset? Yeah. Is it a business or not? Sure. And for, for me, once I figured out that, mm -hmm. it was a whole lot easier from sure. then on out to do all my interviews and say, where do you really truly see this? Right. What do you want to do with this? What are your goals? And if you have a goal, if you say in two years, I want to be out of the day job, I'm like, okay, I can help you. Sure. If you go, I just want to sell a few books, Different I'm going to say, you know what? I have, I have other resources for you. Sure. So here are these people over here. <laughs> right. It will be perfect for you. Which is excellent. You're not yes. turning down customers no. in a harsh way. It's still a positive brand experience. Yes. You still get brand ambassadors that way. Exactly. People are still speaking well of you. It's a good emotional experience. Exactly. Even though you're not picking them up as customers. And, and that, that was one of the uh, key components early on was I figured out all of those jobs that I did before here, they're all about networking. Sure. They're all about getting to know people and, and um, really building relationships with people. Sure. Everything from being a waitress, sure. which is 100% about, I'm going to charm the socks of, off of you right now. And you have 20 minutes to do so. Yes. Yeah. All the way to, you know, some of the more specific unique jobs I did, like being a city, city bus driver. Oh, cool. I mean, that's the same thing, mm -hmm. except I had a little bit longer. Sure. You know, and the question was whether or not they ride the bus every week or, mm -hmm. you know, every once in a huge while. Anyway, so all of those things, though, they really came down to, um, I had to, I'd learned that networking and building a referral system mm -hmm is about 10 times more profitable than anything else, than me trying to do it on my own. Sure. Than me trying to take on everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, once I applied those things that I knew from all the other businesses to this one, it was like, oh, I don't have to have 20 clients. I can have three. And I have now a network. I can, you need an, a copy editor? I got it. Sure. Uh, you need a development auditor, I've got these five. Sure. You need a graphic designer, I've got these 10. You, mm -hmm. you need a actual publisher, because you don't want to do all this, you just want to write the books. Mm -hmm. uh, I have at least one in the genre that sure. you work in, you know? And now that I've built that network and I've built those relationships and, and I have a referral system in place, mm -hmm. I'm not just referring ConvertKit. Right. I'm also referring Gray Gecko Publishing House. I'm also referring uh, Marked Up Editing. I'm also, you know, and mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't get an affiliate kickback for those people, but I also know that client is in good hands and I don't have to worry about them even though they're not mine. Absolutely. And that, and those companies, when they find people that they're not a good fit for, will probably pass people back exactly. to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and a, we've done that before many times. Yeah. A mutually beneficial relationship it doesn't have to be always competitive, yeah. right? That, yeah. And a lot of times we'll, there'll be an author and they'll come to one of us and we'll listen to where they are and what they're working on. We're like, you know what? You don't need me right now. You might need me in two or three years, sure. but you're not at a place where you're ready for Adriel. Sure. So I'm going to send you to Ann, mm -hmm. and Ann's going to get your writing up to par. Sure. So that you can then go 
over to, you know, like, and so we, we have our nice little circle of where is the author and what do they need the most? Sure. Okay, then they need to go to that person. Mm -hmm. And that, having that inner relationship that we all know each other, we all know what our businesses are mm -hmm. and what they do exactly. Sure. Uh, is it's better for all of us. Absolutely. And also, it's better for the authors. Absolutely. They're, they're not getting, this sounds so horrible, but they're not getting someone who Googles what is supposed to be done every single time they're given a task. Right. I mean. And that happens. Yes, and I did that a lot in the beginning too. Sure, sure. Everybody does that in the beginning, sure. but then you have to figure out what you're really good at and really focus on that so you're not Googling it all the time. Right, so you actually have real expertise in, yes. the, in the subject. Yes, exactly. exactly. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the main things I do is I talk to authors that are new and they're excited, mm -hmm. but it's not pure adrenaline sure. and it's not this is my first book right. um, but really it's a okay I plan on turning this into a business mm -hmm. I want to get my mortgage paid off sure. I have to get my kid through braces sure. I whatever it is whatever their goal is mm -hmm. if they're going to be serious about it that's when I'm ready for them so one of the things we talked about on the channel is like not quitting your day job until you can replace your income or until you can meet right. those goals for whatever business you're running, right? right? And we've talked a little bit about the difference between hobby and business like we're talking about here, yes. right? How do you, when is the right time to make the jump and all that kind of stuff. So let me have to ask you about a couple of scenarios. For example, I write a little bit on the side, but I would need to replace my whole income. I have many people who rely on me as yes. who I'm the sole breadwinner for, right? So that's, uh, so it would take me, my initial goal would be like, I want to make a hundred dollars a month. Right. And that would be a business goal, absolutely. Right. But, but, but not, I'm not replacing my income. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. So how, how would you handle an author like that? Uh, in stages. Okay. Really. So um, I had an author come to me and really her only goal at the beginning mm -hmm. was sell five books a month. Sure. And it was, it was, it seemed like a small insignificant goal, mm -hmm. but when she'd sold two books the entire year before, sure. that was a big goal. Absolutely, that's a huge jump, 30 times. Right. Yeah. And you can't really afford an assistant when you're only selling five books a month. Right. However, the goal was much longer than that. Sure. We're like, okay, this is our short-term goal that we're gonna work on right here. Right. And then we, we laid out the next five years for her. Excellent. And said, all right, so really, truly, where do you wanna be in five years? Do sure. you want to completely replace the income if so, let's work backwards and we're going to start with five books a month. Very nice. So um, that's, that's part of the whole stepping it up and scaling it up mm -hmm. is because you don't go from selling nothing to making 5000 a month, 20000 a month mm -hmm. overnight. Right. You don't, you don't do that when you'll have one book under your belt. Right. You don't do that when you have no marketing experience. You don't do that when you don't have a newsletter built up. You can't do that overnight. Right. Even the breakout successes that did do that, mm -hmm. they really had a lot of experience under their belt. They had they already knew marketing or they already knew writing or they already knew some piece of it mm -hmm. and they were just learning a new one. Or they brought a team who had those things already. Exactly. So one of the, one of the benefits previously about having a publisher was they could bring a million people exactly. and get you, get you in front of all the people in supermarkets and everywhere, bookstores and online and everything. Exactly. Now, you and I in the, in the time since, so I ran a publishing house badly 11 years ago, right? <laughs> uh, and that, I, I, I ran an audiobook studio badly oh, okay. a dozen years ago, yes, <laughs> yes. And so th at that time, ebooks were just barely becoming a thing. I right. remember being, what kicked me off was I was in writing classes at Cambridge, I did a study abroad last year of college. And, uh, I was there in Cambridge and I had to take, I had my one course for my degree and then two courses, you had to pick three courses. And so I was yeah. like, writing, that sounds fun, sure. And everybody there was like, ebooks are killing the publishing market, publishing is dying, we will yes. not have letters, libraries will burn to the ground, grab your children, run for the hills, kind of stuff, right? Yes, yes, because it was, everybody felt that way at the beginning. Right. Until we figured out it's not that way. <laughs> exactly. And so I heard that from people, I mean, they had people from uh, in the British publishing market coming in and telling us these things. And yeah. I said, the businessman in me said, no, uh, yeah. right? And so I tried to run right. a publishing house in that scenario, right? But in the past, in the, wow, 12 years since, that is a long time ago. Um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't feel like no, it, but it is. Yes, absolutely. Yes. The market's changed dramatically. And the, yes. and the strength of traditional publishers to put your 
book in front of a lot of eyes has really diminished. It has. So talk to me a little bit about that, like the ability to, the trade-off between spending the five years to build up your your right. your path your own, on your own versus trying to piggyback with somebody who still has some clout to put in right. front of eyes. Talk to me about that, that kind of so tension. Th this is one of those things, there's no one right way to publish. Sure. Um, you can be an author who is 100% traditional published through the big four. Sure. You can be 100% indie who only ever does your own stuff. Right. Everything on your own. Mm -hmm. And then there are about a billion flavors in between. Right. Um, and so for most authors, the sweet spot is actually somewhere in between. It's some kind of hybrid. Okay. Um, and th that blend of I do short stories with anthologies with big publishers, mm -hmm. that gets my name out there. Sure. But then I have control over my novel mm -hmm. series and I can make it exactly what I want because what I want, my vision, is doesn't necessarily match the big publisher's vision. Sure. So, and then in between there's all these small presses and medium presses and to be fair, a lot of head hunting places that are scammy. Sure. Right, so you gotta actually do your due diligence mm -hmm. before you sign up with anybody. Right. Um, but you can have any kind of combination you want. Interesting, okay. So because of that, like when I said, I, I work with a lot of small publishing houses mm -hmm. and what we really focus on is how best to help the authors who really just wanna write the books and they don't wanna do with anything else. Right. You know, that's why you go with the traditional publishers. You don't wanna do anything other than write. Right. How do we work with them and blend that with all of our experience as as indie publishers sure. to help these indie publishers really break out and and grow and get the audience they need so that they could go indie we teach them a lot of stuff in the meantime sure. until we can get them to a point if they wanted to go indie they could so you know most most authors today have some kind of hybrid in there gotcha you know one of my favorite authors she has her very first series is still traditionally published gotcha. every single bit of it sure she's written four series since then they're all indie right right and they're all she writes mysteries and there's just enough difference in the subgenres of the mysteries that that one that is traditionally published it would be hard to do it indie gotcha but some of the ones that were indie published would be very hard to sell traditionally. Gotcha. So um, that this is the, as far as I'm concerned, this is a sweet spot of the publishing industry is now indies have all the tools that we need to be able to do whatever we want mm -hmm. and to look professional. Yeah. If you hire the right people. Right. But we also have the, what remains of the clout of the traditional publishers who can get our name out there when we can't. Nice. So, so one of the things I, one of the problems I ran into running a small, a very small press at the time, right? We ran an e, e magazine and a couple of books in the pipeline. We have other noises on yes. the other side. My apologies to the viewers here. I'll, I'll maybe edit some things. Uh, what is the value proposition of a small press? I remember getting lambasted by the Sith Web leadership. They wrote this whole article about never ever work with a small press. They're the devil. They'll just scam you. They're terrible people and they should go die. And I was running a small press at the time. I was like, well, thank you. Uh, exactly. As long as you spell my name right, like PT Barnum style, right? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, the. Again, it depends on the small press. Sure. But the reason why you might want to go with a small press versus a large press mm -hmm. is the personalized service. Gotcha. It really is, and, and this is like, I as a VA give you personalized service. Sure. I as a business consultant give you personalized, customized, this is for you. Right. And a good indie publisher is going to do the same thing. A small publisher is going to do the same thing. Gotcha. Um, they're going to really take into account your vision for your series. Mm -hmm. They're going to really take into account what your goals are. Mm -hmm. And they're going to give you as many tools as they can to get you there. Right. Um, and some of the large publishing houses can turn into a grist mill. Sure. They're not all that way. And... Sometimes even within the same house, if you have the right pub, the right editor, mm -hmm. it does not feel that way. Sure. With a different editor, it would feel that way. But with an indie or a small press, like 
every single author we have is our author. Right. Like we, right. we work hard for that person. Right. So it has to be personalized, customized. You are the client. You are the one we want to make happy. And therefore, we're going to do everything we can to really help you get your vision in front of you, you know? That makes sense. And published. I, I think one thing I see with small presses is that, goodness, I apologize for this audio here. One thing I see with the small presses is that, it, it kind of like you said, the spectrum, mm -hmm. is that there are small presses who can get you international rights, right? right? International rights sales. Even as a small press for me, I was getting, I actually had a, one other small press in, I think they were, oh goodness, Croatia? Reach yeah. out and say, hey, we have this cool short story. And it was great. Fantasy yep. short story. I, I loved it. And they wanted us to publish it in English and see what we could do. And that was that was an opportunity yes. for that author that they would not have had except through a small press. Certainly an opportunity for my authors. I was going to work backwards. Right? right, exactly. And that would have been an opportunity that would have been hard. You could drum it up as an individual, but, but a small it, press yes. has more access to that. Yes. Now, a large press has even more access than that, but with a commensurate lack of loss of control and all the other exactly. things we talked about. Yeah. And that's why when we go back to, like, once I figured out, Oh, that whole network thing that I did with all the other careers, they, it really works here too. Right. Because, you know, I can transition from being a VA to being a business consultant to being a small press. Sure. And it's all the same stuff. It's yeah. all the same work. Right. The difference is how big is my network? Mm -hmm. The difference is how, much, how many resources can I pull in from elsewhere sure. to give the client what they need? Sure. And to, to me, that 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 was always a natural progression that was always an an end goal a step that okay someday i will get there yeah and you know now i'm steps closer <laughs> to right. being there right so um you know my church is incredible and we have some really incredible authors mm -hmm. And we have a copy machine and a hole punch, right? Sure. And it has been that way for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so now we are setting up a publishing company for the church. Sure. That now we're going to produce the same books that we've produced before, but now they're going to look like an actual book, not a spiral bound notebook, sure. you know? Yeah. And so like, but it, it took years of me learning the the new publishing industry sure. before I could sit down and say, all right, mm -hmm. let's take a look at this and let's do this now. Absolutely. So, but that was one of those progression things. We're going to start out selling five books this month, mm -hmm. but in five years, you're going to be making 30000 a month, no problem. Gotcha. So, steps. Right. Baby, baby steps, baby steps. Right. Well, I want to point out something for our audience, too. One thing I think people fall into traps about, there's kind of a startup. Uh, we, we kind of romanticize startups a lot, right? So much so. And, and so lots of people try to say, hey, I'm going to change the world with this new idea. I'm going to make a new cryptocurrency and change the world. Okay, sure. Um, but a lot of successful, actually a lot of successful large businesses start as successful small businesses. Exactly. And successful small businesses don't have to change the world. Right. right? They have to have a differentiator for their target market, right. not for everything. So one of the things I, I want to call out is just, uh, you're a differentiator, partly is your network. Yes. So compared to other, uh, other author services companies, you have a network that's different than theirs. Exactly. And you don't have to have, you don't even want all author services customers, no, right? You want the ones that you want. Exactly. And that's, that's something that's, I think, very important is that you don't have to do the Silicon Valley hustle to start a business, right? right. It can be 30 customers down to three customers plus really exactly. good clients and other services. And that, that's something I think I really want our viewers to see because a lot of our viewers are, are trying to start a business, right? Right. And that first step is probably not going to be raising a $2 million round. No, right? it's not. No. And that, so uh, we could talk about my failed business. Please, please. <laughs> I may interject with some of mine too. No. So, so, yeah. so I knew early on whatever I did had to be flexible. Sure. I had too many variety of interests mm -hmm. and also my end life goals were uh, diverse enough that I knew I needed to be able to pick up and go do the other job sure. at the drop of a hat. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of those careers that I had for 20 years were literally part-time jobs that I was on and off the schedule all the time. Sure. But because of that, I could take care of ill 
Um, yeah, not well. Back then, it was my grandparents and my aunts sure. and uncles, you know. But yeah, sure. I could I could take care of family members that mm -hmm. are real. I could have kids that were not in daycare 24/7, you know. Sure. And I I could do all the other things, and I had flexibility. Mm -hmm. So that for me, flexibility was a huge thing. Right. The um, obvious choice for flexibility mm -hmm. is MLMs. To be perfectly honest. Sure. Uh, Multi-level marketing groups, which I think, I don't know if we've talked about on the channel. Um, I may post a link. Uh, oh, by the way, please send me all your links for all your free okay. links. We'll post them in the descriptions. Uh, Multi-level marketing schemes statistically tend to enrich the owner of the scheme, not the salespeople of the scheme. Bingo. So um, I tried a couple. Gotcha. And to be fair, we, my husband and I did a lot of research on them, and sure. we, we chose the ones we chose for very specific reasons. They sure. were, they, their core values lined up with ours. Sure. So there was no feeling sleazy. They were products we actually used and liked. Gotcha. Um, so it, I didn't feel like I was trying to sell the Sahara to someone, the you sand know? The Sahara, yeah. Or a swamp land in Florida, or <laughs> what a, a bridge that doesn't actually exist. Right. Like I didn't feel skeezy, right? And that was a big deal for Absolutely, me. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but the hustle required for those. Mm -hmm. Again, it's all about the networking. It Absolutely. really is. Until you build that platform out underneath you and go as wide as and as deep as you can in the ML, yeah, then you're you're just paying the person up above you right you know and so yeah I put in the hustle mm -hmm. I and I worked hard and I made all kinds of connections with all kinds of people and that environment is great for an entrepreneur it's sure. very encouraging it's sure. very we're gonna cheer you on we're gonna be here for you but not necessarily is it depending upon which company and who it is that's your upline sure that might not be successful for you um and so i did several of those sure <laughs> well one thing i i want to mention one of the downsides of multiple marketing schemes you put in all the hustle of your own business and you have no equity at the end yes you own nothing of it yes so you do all the work as if you had your own business and you have nothing to sell afterwards I have really great discounts for <laughs> products that I use. Okay, that's that, what it that's comes fair. down okay, to. That's fair. I don't pay full price for any of the products that I use. That, okay, that's And fair. I still use them, so. So that, that can be legitimate. Yes. That, yeah, that can be useful. But that wasn't my goal. My goal was to work from home. Right. And that is not a goal I succeeded at. Right. It, it was not. Anyway, so after a couple of those, sure. um, my husband was like, I have a business idea. And I said, okay, let's hear your business idea. Sure. Let's be clear. I am the creative one. I am the entrepreneur. I am the one who wants to go conquer the world and I have a brand new idea to, to conquer the world every day. My husband is the accountant. <laughs> nice. Technically, he's a, he's a scientist, sure. but he's right. the one at home going, could you also drive the bus while you also do selling XYZ. I'm hearing so many parallels in my wife and my relationship. Yes. Yes. Keep going. So when he says, I have an idea, mm. I'm all like, it's got to work better than mine have up to now, right? I've had that exact conversation with my <laughs> wife when she has ideas. Yes. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. So it was got to be something that we're passionate about, mm -hmm. which for us, one of the many things that we're passionate about is supercars. Oh, nice. Okay. McLaren. Honing, Zeg, what is that one? Everything. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If it has a pretty price tag, <laughs> it's got our attention. Nice. That's not the only qualification, sure. of course. We want it to go fast. We want it to feel good. We want it to really be great. Sure. We also like that when it's green. So, like, you know, currently the Tesla Plaid is like the okay. best thing in the world, yeah. right? Okay. So, there are services that take a car mm -hmm. and let you rent it for a day or a week mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. but they only do the cars that you can't pick up from Hertz. Sure. It, this is not something you're gonna find on the lot mm -hmm. at Enterprise right. for a dollar. <laughs> right. You're only gonna find this 
uh, it's supercar lots. Mm -hmm. And it's a very specialized rental market. Sure. Because... Very high-end customer, very specific mm -hmm. type of high-end customer. Yeah. Yeah. They're either trying out a car because they're thinking about buying it, mm -hmm. or they're wealthy enough to want the experience, but they actually don't want the hassle of owning the car. Right. Right. Or the car is a little bit too expensive. So I'll just rent it for a week mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll get the experience of driving the Viper and then I'm happy. But my wife and I were through a clerical error. My wife and I were invited to test drive some Audi um, supercars. Yes. So we, we test drove a $750,000 Audi car on a track that had rocks in it. So we're driving at 75 miles an hour. <laughs> rocks are pinging the bottom. Right. $750,000 is more than all of our rental investments combined. It's more than our mortgage. That's three times our mortgage. Precisely, yes, yes. yes. And so, so my wife and I said, you know, that was very fun. That was a nice once in a lifetime experience. Exactly. <laughs> Let's put that away, yes. Exactly. Well, though there are businesses that do that and they're mm -hmm. very successful. I would right. like to point out that they are on the coasts. Yes. Uh, the only one not on the coasts is one in Chicago. Okay, interesting. I would have thought Las Vegas. Potentially. That's close to the coast. Okay, fair, fair. <laughs> okay, so when I say the coast, I mean like within 100 miles inland. Okay, sure. But they're all major metropolitan areas. Absolutely. They all have billions of people living within sure. a very short amount of space. We live in northwest Arkansas, which is literally the center of the United States. Sure. Um, we are within a couple of hours from many large cities, mm -hmm. but we're not a large city. Right. Um, and we figured if we set up here, mm -hmm. then the people in the large cities in Central America who, who, do, who do not live on the coast but right. might want to drive a big car, they would, they would drive a couple of hours to come rent a car from us. Sure. We also live near Walmart, Tyson, Jones Trucking, J.B. Hunt Trucking and the University of Arkansas. Oh, nice. That is Northwest Arkansas's economy. Sure. Four of those bring in people from all over the world. They bring business to Arkansas. Right. And if you're going to be in Arkansas for a week for a bunch of business meetings and you could rent any car you want, mm -hmm. why not go with a supercar company? Absolutely. That's a, right? really, that's a smart market hypothesis, right? We yes. talk about hypothesis testing I think, quite a bit. Yeah. Interesting. So how did that work out? What was your, how did you test the hypothesis? Um, well, we talked to a lot of business owners Excellent. Okay, um, okay. in Northwest Arkansas and all of them were like, yes. Nice. We talked to a bunch of car enthusiasts from all the financial spectrum. Sure. And all of them were, yes. Okay, excellent. We talked to the other companies mm -hmm. who are successful at it and they were all like, you're in the negative space. You should be able to fill it just sure. fine. Yeah. Um, so it all looked good. Sure. All signs are go thus far. Mm -hmm. Did you have pre-orders? We did. Okay, excellent. Yes. So, yeah. That's usually the sign of really good market. That's your best market validation. If somebody's paying yes. you to provide yes. the service in advance. Yes. That's a good, good symbol. Yes. Doesn't mean it'll work always, but it's a good sign. We had funding. It wasn't necessarily all the kind of funding I would have wanted. Sure. It was one of those, we're going to put our skin in the game. Um, and then we're going to get a little help so that later on we can open for stocks and angel sure. investors and all that stuff. But sure. in the meantime, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do it. So when you said you got funding, bank loan, angel investor, um, family and friend money. We had our own money. Okay. And Savings are great. Yes. Yeah. And we also had some lines of credit. Started businesses that way as well, yes. Can I ask how much your initial investment was? Supercars are not cheap. Uh, almost $200,000. Wow. Yes. I mean, good on you guys for saving up and having that access. That's yes. phenomenal. Yeah, well done. The problem came when <clears throat> the city approved our business license. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to rezone the city. Oh, no. And because we weren't open yet, and we were not settled in. We suddenly were not grandfathered into the new zonings. Oh no. So they said, you can still have the business, it just can't be here. We said, okay, so where can it be? And they started showing us where the new zones were. Right. And there was nothing. Oh, jeez. Nothing. Either 
it was a building we could have bought but we couldn't have afforded. Right. Or if it was a place that we could have rented, it was not in the right place as far as our Rats. branding yes. and our marketing went. Exactly. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna rent out luxury high end, high -end cars, mm -hmm. you do not want to be in a neighborhood sure. that looks like shootings happen every night. Right. You know, you want to be in a nice neighborhood. I, I had an option to rent a warehouse once, cheap, and I got there and there was a, literally a homeless man sleeping in a car that had no wheels on the lot and the roof had collapsed in the middle. That was why it was cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Not the warehouse I ended up renting. Yes. Yeah. So we, we searched, oh my gosh, we, and we went outside of that city. We went, looked mm -hmm. at all the cities in Northwest Arkansas and we looked at tons of options. Sure. Like literally when they did that, mm -hmm. I was cleaning the place that we had in order to paint. Oh, sheesh. And that weekend, my husband was going to pick up the first car. Wow. Were you able to save your investment? Parts of it, yes. Ouch. So, so entrepreneurs, be warned. I've lost, uh, I have lost $90,000 paychecks before to, to uh, investments. It sounds like you've been in the same boat. Yeah. That's, yeah. So one of the appealing things about MLMs is mm. depending upon the MLM, you can start out paying $20 and that's your total investment, right? right? Others, once you buy the products or whatever, you've spent like $500. Sure. I almost wish we could go back to the $500, right? Sure. Because once you've put $200,000 into a business and it never opens, right. it is very painful. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we just, we looked for another year. We tried for a whole another year. We were still going to the car shows and we were still doing all of the businesses. We were doing everything still with the hope that we would find another place and open. Right. And after a whole year, we still couldn't find another place. Um, and so- And you've been paying car payments this whole time. No, because okay. we had not actually picked up the car. Okay, good, good. That at least is- Yes, that was, that was the saving grace. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad we hadn't picked up that first car. Right. Um, but we'd invested in the initial setup of the building. Mm -hmm. Like we had the furniture was already ordered and on the way. Oh, like sheesh. so much stuff. Sure. Um, all the branding um, to do the car shows and mm -hmm. to do all the uh, various marketing that we did. I mean, like we put a lot of money into marketing. Yeah. And never opened it never opened mm -hmm. so that then became family debt <laughs> Oof. I've been there also <laughs> for our viewers one one I give viewers challenges occasionally one challenge I have for you here is what ways if you were running that business what ways could you have started drawing revenue and this is not a fair question for you so no, I'm asking no. our viewers and thank you to brainstorm fully it's okay yeah so as viewers brainstorm could you think of some ways you could have you could start a business like that without that risk of a building so the building, it sounds like, became a millstone. It was. So if there's a way, a millstone around your neck, an English expression, uh, about something being very bad that pulls you down. Think about your challenge, your homework for tonight. Think about ways you could start a business like that without that huge investment on the business and the building first. Because if you yeah. could have done that, you could have been in revenue without the, yes. right, that could have it would be cash flow positive, that would have been a whole different scenario, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I've been in the same boat where we've had businesses that never, I spend a lot of money and they never, I'll yeah. share one that's kind of funny, if you don't okay. mind. Much smaller. Um, I wanted to, I, I played Dungeons and Dragons, right? And nerdy stuff, right? And uh, we wanted to make dice out of bones. We saw, we were looking at the, the market, mm -hmm. and uh, there was only one other competitor. They were charging $400 a set. We said, we can sell these for 300 or 200 And I knew how to scale. I had yes. contacts in the meat processing industry. I'd worked in ingredients before, right? And so I said, I can, I can set up those supply chains. Yes. And we can set up them. I've worked in smart manufacturing. I can set up the, the machinery to, to make these, right? You know, yes. on, on mass, right? Uh, and so we had this whole, beetle maceration plan to clean the bones. I mean, we, were, we had this like multi-step process. Yes. All the times worked out and the whole thing on paper. On paper. On paper. That would be the key. Exactly. <laughs> that so, we, yeah. So we worked it all on paper and I was starting to buy pieces to do the tests. And we, we bought some of the equipment. We started doing tests. We got it working. It stopped working with our family. So family stuff came up and put us on pause. I only right. spent maybe $500 on these different pieces of equipment to do the sample level ones, right? Right. Then a year later, the when we put it down, we never ended up picking it back up because life intervened, right? Right. A year later, though, 
that one competitor we talked about started using human bones. And we said, you know, this no longer, this industry no longer aligns with our moral compass. No, we're, we're no, We're very no. glad we're not in that business anymore. Uh, yes. Cow bones, because you're gonna eat that steak is one thing, yes. but. Yes, but that was Uncle Phil. Yeah, yeah, that's not Grave so robbing is not something I would agree with. Right, and they were like, these are medical cadavers. I'm like, I don't, I don't care. Do you, or care, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does not matter at that point. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So much dramatically smaller example, but yes. yes, same kind of thing. We we spend a lot of money, a lot of money. We never have the ground. And so kind of my, my big takeaway from that failed business was you don't become a breakout author overnight. Mm -hmm. And if you set up your business like you're going to be selling 20,000 overnight, you're doomed. you are doomed. Yep. You need to set up your business like you're not going to sell any books at all for the first 10 years. That's wise. And you need to set up your software company and your laundromat and your real estate business and whatever, your, it is. whatever company it is. I get, that's why we say don't quit your day job. If you're acting out of desperation, which I did as a young yes. entrepreneur, I graduated with a degree in sociology. I knew nobody was going to pay me a dime, right? So, <laughs> right, like, right? so let me start a business and make my own way. And that, to be fair, that has helped my career. Yes. But the business failed hard. Right. Because I wasn't, I couldn't afford the slow burn. Right? Exactly. I had to do something right then, which made, led me into bad decisions. So we went back to working insane hours and lots of different jobs sure. to pay off all, all that. that debt. Right. Right. Okay. So we did all that and when we were engaged and first married before we had kids. So sure. we, we lived the majority of our marriage mm -hmm. debt free and then the business failed and now we have a lot of debt all of a sudden right. that we're working on again. Okay. Yeah. So these two time periods and it was a million times harder to do it with three kids than it was when it was just the two of us. Yes. Because when it's just the two of us. Pull a 16 hour day, pull an 18 hour day. Yes. And we can talk on the phone and we, you know, even if we're passing ships in the night, at least we saw each other once in a while. Right. We weren't juggling kids. Doing it again the second time with kids was so much harder because it limited what jobs we could take, mm -hmm. what kinds of schedules we could keep, mm -hmm. and you know, like, yes, we were gazelle intense, but it was still a slow climb, a slow process because we just, we didn't have the flexibility anymore that we had when we were in our early 20s and sing, in no kids. That, that was exactly the thing for us with the bone dice. Yeah. Day jobs intervened, life intervened. We, my wife and I have many children, and so that's, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't trade any of them for a business, right? right. I'm very, I, I, I'm, I do not look back on regret with my right. priorities and how I've prioritized my decisions. But it is absolutely true, 10 years earlier, I could have gotten that done, right? right? That would not, I would have been in a very bad industry, granted, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but you're right, it yeah. was much easier without those constraints. So, be, but because we had done that, mm -hmm. a lo one of the biggest takeaways I took from it was like the MLMs that you have a low buy-in mm -hmm. whatever business I start next had to have a low enough buy-in that we were never going to go back to two hundred thousand dollars in debt again right we've talked about this on the channel too yeah what do you have access to right one of my failed businesses I did a 3d printing company where we did scans at conventions like this one and 3d printed action figures of people at one inch I sold my half of the business partner there were some good things about it some bad things about it that's a different story for another time uh, but from there, I saw that there's opportunity in additive manufacturing, industrial manufacturing, metal. Yes. I was like, great. All the machines at the time are $500,000 machines. I can make one that we, we could build for 110 and sell for 260. Yeah. I got four or five, I think I had five pre-orders. So we're like, yes, if you can be, make this a spec, we'll buy it. We had some patents that applied for. I got a little $5,000 grant from the state of Utah. And like, I hired some student engineers to help me like, yeah. write, draw it up in CAD and the whole thing, right? Um, I needed half a million to a million dollars to build the first one. Exactly. Right? And yeah, it was already sold, but it didn't matter. I didn't it's, have half a million dollars. Exactly. And so when I went to, I tried to raise funds, I went and pitched all the VCs and everything, and I, I screwed that up somehow. I didn't get money, right? I right. did something wrong in that process. Um, that was not a business I could do. I mean, yeah. that was not a plausible business for me, regardless of my ability to sell and my ability to invent and my ability to, I didn't have the resources. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So one of the big things with Adriel Wiggins Author Services, which at that time, it was just, Adriel sure <laughs> um, was 
for for the, it began with I was driving Uber because mm -hmm. it was one of the many jobs I could do. Right. Possible. And I put the kids to bed, mm -hmm. and then my husband would sit down and do his online job, mm -hmm. and I would hop in the car and I would drive Uber. Yeah. Late at night, only the drunk people. Right. <laughs> so, but between rides, mm -hmm. I was editing on my phone. Ah, uh, gotcha. So I, that's how it started was it was just editing mm -hmm. and it was jobs I could do on my phone sure. between car rides. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I did was like, okay, if I'm going to do the VA stuff, I need to go to school for it. But these two editing jobs just paid for me to be able to go to take this course to learn how to do it, right? Sure. Um, okay, now that I've done the course and I, I want to add VA clients, that's gonna take like an actual website, an actual branding, which I didn't need as an editor sure. when it was just me on the internet going, hey, I edit, sure. you know? So, okay, I need an actual business presence. Well, this editing job just paid for that, but you know? Right. And it was one step at a time. Like mm -hmm. where I am now in 2022 is vastly different than where I was in 2016. Right. And it has 100% to do with the slow build of that business. Mm -hmm. In 2016, I could not have even have imagined me selling courses and books and, and having so many affiliates right. because I just wanted to edit. Sure. That's all I wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know, but one tiny step at a time over the course of years got me to where I only work two or three hours a day Nice. and I am making five times more than I was making with Uber. I believe it. So, but that was, that was not overnight. Right. And it was literally, I don't take that step until I have enough money to do it, which means I might put it off a month or two. So the camera you're look, we're filming yeah. with right now, the lens on it's a Rokinon cinema lens. Uh -huh. It's not cheap, right? No, no, it's not. I, I, my wife and I decided that we would not buy a lens like that until I had generated enough consulting business on the Moonlight Consulting business right. from the Business Rogue YouTube channel to buy that lens, which we exactly. did. Exactly. So we let the consulting business pay for the consulting business to grow. Right? Exactly. And, and now I'm not taking on other consulting clients at the moment because my current day job, I got a large raise in promotion. I no longer need to take on those right? in that <laughs> right. regard, right? But it's exactly what you're talking about, letting it grow organically. The photographer, when I was like 10 or 12, I asked a photographer at a concert once, like he was a concert photographer. I was like, hey, how do you get into that? I, you know, photography's fun. How do you do that? And he's like, my one piece of advice to you, don't buy equipment until you can afford it from your jobs. Yes. Like, and that was, it's kind of what we're talking about. It's a slow exactly. burn, the slow growth. It, if I could redo anything, it mm -hmm. would be the supercar business. We would not have put as much money up in front. Sure. And which is weird to say, because when you are looking at funding for a new business, one of the biggest things they say is, before I invest in you, I want to know that you've put money into it. I want right. to see that you have, you have skin in the game. That, right. was, that was a phrase we heard all, all the time. Right. From banks, from investors, from friends and family, from funds. Everybody. From grant organizations. Everybody. Yes. yes. We want to see the skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So we put it in and we lost the skin. Mm -hmm. That's all there was to it. When I was a young entrepreneur with no money to my name, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I was like, look, I've spent two years of my life. That's all the skin I have to put in the game. I don't have a hundred grand. We did that too. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's Along with the 200 grand. Exactly. Yeah. So again, start the business you can. Exactly. And so that is, to me, that is the biggest thing about the internet. And this goes to the indie publishing is there are resources now mm -hmm. that we did not have 20 years ago. Or five years ago. Exactly. Even, yeah. And so nearly any business that you want to start now, start online. Learn about it online mm -hmm. first. Yeah see what other people are doing and then take the first step and the next step and the next step mm -hmm. and let it grow a little bit at a time. Right. Do not try to start a supercar rental business with $200,000 and nothing else. In, in, unless you can find a way to do it incrementally, right? If you can find <laughs> yeah. some other way to do that. If we could have done it incrementally, yeah. that would have been fine, yeah. but we couldn't, sure. you know, we didn't. Sure. We, we were foolish with that. So, um, but yeah, for me starting, where I am now with my business, mm -hmm. I couldn't have imagined it 20 years ago when I was submitting poetry to public to children's magazines. 
I couldn't have imagined it 10 years ago when we were failing at MLMs and, and the car rental business. I, I couldn't have imagined it five years ago when I started it. Sure. Um, and now I have further goals mm -hmm. that I would never have imagined sure. before. But it's one step at a time. And when you do one step at a time, if the ground starts shifting and everything goes total crap because the economy just tanked. Or a pandemic happened or whatever. You're still okay. Right. Because this little bit of ground that I'm standing on right now is solid. Like everything around me may be falling apart. Right. But where I'm standing is solid. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic really hurt a lot of people and I hurt a lot. 2020 was the worst year ever. No, 2021 was the worst year sure, ever. Right. I'm like, these have been like two of the best years of my life. Sure. They're not the best. Sure. Um, but they don't even compare to some of the worst years of my life when right. we were like clawing our way out of a hole right. that we dug for ourselves. You know, that was so much worse than the pandemic. And I'm all like, my clients still sending me stuff, so I'm still working, you know? Right. But that also, that didn't happen overnight. That was, that was years of just one step at a time building up to where I was solidly okay when the pandemic hit. Um, it's, yeah. I want to give you hope, like mm -hmm. no matter what your industry is, no matter what you're doing, no matter what your business is, you can get to a place where you're solid enough that if everything else falls apart, you'll be okay. It takes time. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes, yes, skin in the game. Right. It, it does not happen overnight, but you can get there. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big things, and that's really the course that I've been working on for the last year is called Weathering the Storm. Sure. I want to get authors to the place where when absolute worst happens, they're okay, their business is fine. It doesn't matter if their personal life is falling apart. It doesn't matter if the entire rest of the right. industry is falling apart. Their business is okay. Mm -hmm that may be scaled back for a little bit. Sure. It may be, we may go down to four walls, which is just in personal finance. That is, we're going to take care of our house mm -hmm. and not worry about anything else for right sure. now. Right. So I, I want that concept of the four walls to transfer to a business, mm -hmm. to an author business. If, if you only have resources to work one hour a week, what's the most important thing to keep your business still running? Right. And once we get those two or three things, mm -hmm. once we know what they are and they're in place, then we can add in and scale and do all the really fun stuff. Right. But when I got COVID this summer and I was totally knocked out right. for two whole months with COVID, and then we found, then we had other, you know, other things happen for the last six months. I, my business went down to four walls. Sure. And a lot of it was because were, we were taking care of personal things, that, family things, right? Yeah. But the business went down to four walls mm -hmm. and it still survived sure. and it still worked and it's still, everything still ran. Mm -hmm. And my clients were all still happy. Right. Now, did my social media presence kind of diminish? Sure. And yes, it did. Yeah. Because that wasn't the important thing. My clients were the important thing. Right. Their work got done. Right my business work didn't necessarily get done, but I didn't need to grow right then. Right. I needed four walls while I took care of all the personal stuff. Well, and that's one of the things that's really advantageous about organic growth trajectory is when I'm, if I take VC funding, I have two to five years to generate a 20X return exactly. or, or more, right? 20, preferably 100,000 X return, right? Right. Um, and so there's a time, there's a ticking time off. There is. Right, and so rapid growth uh, is rapidly painful. Rapidly painful. You have all the pains that you would have had over five years when you had time to adjust to it compressed into six months or exactly. a year, right? And so there's a, it's a lot easier to fail that way when it's just shoved together in that time frame. Yes. And, and the, the larger your, if you had had, for whatever reason, if you'd had to maintain all of those things at once and you got COVID, which we'll all have to bleep out for all of these videos for the way, otherwise YouTube will take this off the air, but for a strange disease of, of discussion of late. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was sick. 
Uh, yes, there we go. <laughs> um, if you were in a venture capital fund in that regard, uh, you, you probably would have lost the business. Yeah. I mean, that's. If we were still doing the rental car business, you'd be under. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's. And and not two hundred thousand under that probably probably would have been a lot more under. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So yes, and that that is that's one of the biggest things when I sit down with authors and I'm like, what are your goals? What do you want? We look at the five year plan, but mm -hmm. we're we're going to look at what's the plan for this month. Sure. We're going to take you one baby step at a time because at no point do we want you to go, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. We want you to slowly build the confidence and the skills and and the audience and everything else that you need mm -hmm. step by step so that someday you can have a million screaming fans sure. and it is just as comfortable as the day that you have zero fans and you're going to a con going please buy my book <laughs> right. right right and everything in between we want it all to feel like a smooth transition um, where yes it, you grow but you grow in scale and you do it slowly enough that you're not overwhelmed. There's a, an example from a video game from long ago uh, that I really like. It's um, somebody asks a wizard to move a mountain for him. He says, you want to move a mountain? Here's a shovel. Yeah. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> After you move the mountain that way, I'll teach you how to do it faster. But I can't teach you faster until you've done the work. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the, for and me, that was, that's the biggest thing about discipline. Yeah. When you learn the business one tiny piece at a time on the ground level and you have actually learned every piece of the job, mm -hmm. then when you get to the CEO's office, you understand your people a whole lot better. Yes. And you can empathize with them a whole lot better. Yes. And you know their needs better. Mm -hmm. And you're a better leader at that point. Right. You know? And, you know, I may never have a whole big business with a big team under me sure. ever again sure it may only be me for the rest of my life and i'm okay with that right but if i do grow into a large business i already know how to do it mm -hmm. because i've already put in all the work step right. by step to get to where i am now mm -hmm. so slow change is often a lot more sustainable than large change that's weight loss yeah i mean as painful as awesome as those videos are you know you're playing a game on your phone and it goes to an ad and like someone lost 50 pounds in two months and then this other person lost like 300 pounds in a year and and you're like those are appealing right we like the easy button we like the quick fix sure but how many of them actually keep the weight off personal story so we my, our we were just getting back into YouTube, mm -hmm. right? I have not grown very quickly in YouTube because we've stopped shooting for the past six months, but our, our studio funded. Right. And so for family reasons, we've had to kind of put it on pause to fix some stuff. Um, but in that time, I've lost 30 pounds and gained 15 back. Yeah. Right? Versus mm -hmm. in the last six months between COVID and then figuring out what was wrong with my health and other family things, I've lost 35 pounds and not put any of it back on. Phenomenal. Well done. But it's literally been a pound a week. Mm -hmm. A pound a week. A pound a week is 50 pounds a year. It is. That's phenomenal. Exactly. But it's a lot more sustainable than 50 pounds in six months or three months or two months. One of those MLMs I did, mm -hmm. you know, sure. health stuff. Sure. I lost 50 pounds in th three weeks. Wow. And then it came back on. Right. So this last six months, a pound a week, less some weeks, sure. a little bit more other weeks. Mm -hmm. I can sustain this. Right. I can sustain this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm not on some crazy diet. I'm not on some crazy pill that's right. like taking all of my body's resources and shooting them out. Right. You know, I'm not doing anything crazy. Mm -hmm. One small step here, one small change here, one small change here, and in the end all they all add up together. Right. And people who haven't seen me in a year or 6 months are like what happened to you? Right. None of my clothes fit anymore. That's it. <laughs> you know, everything, problems, everything, yeah. everything doesn't fit. And that's totally okay <laughs> because I have more energy and I feel better and I'm, I'm keeping the weight off and it's mm -hmm. not, it's not piling back on just because I decided to eat French fries Once. while I was at conference, you know? Yeah. So yeah. As, as in life, 
so in business, right? This yes. Is, yeah. Adriel, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for being with us. I will post links for all the stuff you send me. So okay. send me those affiliate links and we'll post some stuff for your website <laughs> well, and things. Well, everything's on my website. Okay, excellent. So, so from my website, you can find all of that stuff that I have talked about. Um, awesome. And that's adrielwiggins.com. Awesome. So. We'll put that in the link as well, of course, in yeah. the description, but you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Adriel, thank you so much. Thank you. We're glad to have you here on the channel. All right.